Okay, I think we are good to go. So welcome everyone to our webinar today. Uh, my name is Anthony, I'll be your presenter. Uh, we haven't had a webinar in a while, so um, we decided to give this webinar on the topic of uh, medical device testing. Um, we're gonna give uh, electrical safety test overviews, which I'll talk about, uh, the medical device testing requirements per IEC 60601-1, and um, something we call a, a med test, uh, med test overview, which my colleague Bashan will be uh, joining us later to walk us through those uh, specific stringent tests. So let me uh, get a couple notes out of the way. Please use our Q&A utility to ask any questions you may have. Um, if you're having any issues hearing me or seeing any video, please reach out. Uh, via the chat and Brittany will be able to help you sort those out. There is her email. Let me introduce the team actually. So as I said, my name is Anthony. I'm an applications engineer here at Iconics USA and I will be your presenter today. We have a special treat. We have Bishan as a presenter as well. He will take over um, a little bit later in the webinar to talk about um, leakage testing, which is probably the most uh, stringent and, and hard to grasp concept when it comes to medical device testing. Uh, today, our panelist is Syed B. Uh, he is our applications leader. So, any questions that you do have uh, via the chat, he will be able to answer those for you. And our organizer, as always, is Brittany Soha. Okay, so let me make sure there's no comments here. Okay, looks like Brittany's handling the questions. Let me just. Okay, looks like we're all set. So let's talk about our learning objectives today. Um, as I said previously, we're going to go over electrical safety test overviews. That'll be uh, general overviews on the test that we see in IEC 606 1, um, which is the medical device standard. We're going to talk specifically about what those tests, uh, what their purposes are, how you uh, practice them, and uh, making sure we're doing them right per the standard. Um, hence, the test requirements per IEC will delve into the actual standard and see what it's saying, what, what specific parameters you should be using. And then lastly, uh, well not lastly, but next we'll do a medical device testing application overview. This is where we will bring Vishan in he will walk you through a, a complete med test from, from start to finish. So we've, uh, we've created a way to automate these tests from, from hypo to uh, mains and applied part leakage. And uh, I'm not sure if we're gonna go all the way to mains and applied part, but we're gonna show you how you can automate all these tests uh, using AutoWare 3, which will be um, the last thing we'll cover, a, a demo with Bishan. So these are our common medical electrical safety tests uh, that are found within that standard. So AC HIPA, HIPA standing for a high potential test. Um, recently gotten a lot of questions on, on, is this considered a breakdown test? Is this considered a, a destructive test? When, when I perform this test, should I be wary of sending this product out to customers? Has it somehow been degraded? And so those are two different distinctions when it comes to the high test. It, it can be a destructive test if, if that's your end goal, to keep raising the voltage until uh, you see the insulation actually break down. But um, the spirit of the AC high pot test and, and what's called out in the standards is not that. So it's not meant to be a destructive test. It's meant to verify the integrity of your insulation. And so obviously the AC high pot test is using AC voltage. Uh, but the DC hypo test, it's the exact same concept, uh, but with DC. And so what makes that different? Well, we know that DC does not change polarity. It doesn't oscillate. So you don't constantly have a change in voltage. So what's that mean? Is we lose that reactive current that we see when performing the AC hypo test. Um, the DC hypo is beneficial when testing uh, capacitive products or products that have like a, like a huge spool of cable, 
Um, when the AC high pot test creates too much reactive current, that's when you have the option in the standard to switch to DC. Our ground bond test is also testing the integrity of something, but that's testing the integrity of our ground circuit on our device. Um, and lastly, we're going to cover uh, leakage testing. That goes from uh, touch current to patient current, patient auxiliary current to uh, mains and applied part leakage. And again, like I said, we'll have uh, Vashan come in and discuss those specifically and in detail with you. So before we can talk about the ground bond test, let's state what makes a good ground. Okay, so uh, there's a few different sources here. Uh, the NEC National, Ele National Electric Code uh, states that a ground should protect people and property from electrical hazards. Okay, that's a very general overview. Um, the NEC 250-45 says any exposed non-current carrying metal parts of a cord and plug connected equipment which may become energized shall be grounded. So that's just stating what it's what it's necessity in electrical products. But what it actually is, is a permanent and continuous conductive path, uh, capacity to conduct fault current and low impedance to limit the voltage to ground. So why do we want our ground circuit to be the lowest uh, impedance on our product? And that's to make sure that the human body is never the path that current chooses to take. So that's, that's what makes a good ground circuit. Okay, so now how do we make sure we have a good ground? And that's the ground bond test. The ground bond test verifies the integrity of the ground connection between exposed metal and ground wire of the power cord. High current is injected into the ground pin of the product's power cord, which flows through the chassis and is returned on an accessible grounded part. Um, so what are we talking about there? We're talking about the actual ground pin on our input plug. Okay, we want to make sure from that initial point, uh, which is in essence the, the end of your product, right? That once that ground prong is plugged into your wall, do I have a continuous path from there to all parts of your accessible chassis, any conductive metal parts? Uh, and so we'll be injecting high current from one of those points. It really doesn't matter which point. Uh, as long as you're uh, returning on one, uh, injecting on one point, returning on the other, we're measuring the impedance that we see when we inject, uh, whether it's 10 amps, 20 amps, uh, depending on your standard, uh, making sure that if a fault does occur, there is still no shock hazard to the end user, that the current is being absorbed by the ground circuit, sent straight to ground through your wall outlet, uh, and if any fault occurs, there's still no hazard to the user. So, in other words, it determines if the safety ground wire is capable of handling excessive current flow in case a fault occurs and the product's insulation fails. So, let's take a look at this uh, diagram here. Uh, the left side, you can think of it as an, an Omnia 2 hypo, uh, hypo tester or dielectric analyzer, um, and the right side is your product. Okay, you see the three prong line cord here, uh, and we see current being ejected, injected from the Omnia into the ground. And uh, as we follow along, this resistor here is what we're measuring. That is, in essence, the impedance value of the ground circuit. And what's great about uh, our testers, which not all of them have, is, is we have a a four wire Kelvin connection. And so uh, a lot of times your leads or, or the resistance within the cables you're using to run these tests can inadvertently add resistance to cause a false failure. So when you're measuring with four wire Kelvin connection, we've already offset those cables. Um, and that's what you're seeing here uh, with the Kelvin and the return. So again, current is injected into the ground pin the Omni is now measuring how much resistance it's seen on that ground circuit by measuring the, the voltage drop across that circuit. And the current is then returned to the Omnia. And this Kelvin point is where we're actually measuring the resistance. So the ground bond test is commonly considered a type test, which means 
it's done on the production floor. Once you've your your design of a new product and it's passed all those lab tests, you can now implement a ground bond and a hypo test into production. And those are type tests. Uh, and it's generally performed before hypo test. So let's think about that. Why would the ground bond test be performed before the hypo, which is why I'm presenting in this way. I want to make sure we talk about ground bond first and then we get the hypo. So uh, many of you probably know is if you forget to connect your return clip during a hypo test, a lot of people assume you, you're going to get a failure, but um, with all things being equal it, and no special parameters to catch that type of uh, accidental uh, error, you're going to pass a hypo test because you're testing air, right? Air is a perfect insulator. And so a hypo test with no cables and you hit the start button, you're going to get a pass test. And so the problem is when you run high pop before ground bond, you haven't ensured yet that you have a continuous path to ground. So you could be connecting your return clip for high pop onto your chassis. But if there's a break in you're in essence testing air. And so you'll always be passing or that product and specific, uh, specifically will always pass a high pot test. That's why it's really important to implement a ground bond test or at the very least a ground continuity test uh, before you run your high pot test. So back to the ground bond, the results of this test are displayed in ohms, really milli ohms is what we're looking for. Uh, most standards dictate uh, 200 milli ohms max that your ground circuit should have when performing the ground bond test and the current applied may vary. The ground conductor of a product must have a low enough impedance to handle any fault current. Again, just repeating what, uh, what I said earlier, if that insulation of the product were to fail and now there's excess current being delivered to uh, the metal chassis of a product, when I come into contact with it, there's a chance that I become the path to ground if that ground circuit isn't there or if that ground circuit can't handle the magnitude of current uh, that's being seen. Uh, so that's why a ground bond test is very important. So test parameters for ground bond tests vary from standard to standard. Uh, manufacturers must consult the safety standard which they are trying to comply with before setting test parameters. So let's talk about the standard that uh, we're going to be delving into today which is IEC or UL 60601-1, third edition. So it states for impedance and current carrying capability, current should be 25 amps or one and a half times the highest rated current, uh, the product's highest rated current, uh, whichever is uh, greater, plus 10%. Okay, so for the most part, you're gonna see about a 25 amp test. Um, and that should be passed through the protective earthing circuit uh, with frequency at 50 or 60 hertz depending on what the product was designed for these days design their most products are designed for both uh, in us and uk or in europe so 60 hertz is pretty much the default and uh, no load voltage of uh, less than six volts so they're also dictating i want to make sure the voltage that is driving this current is is a very low uh, low, low force pushing this current. That's that way. When it does see a bit of resistance, um, that test can shut off and stop. Um, because again, that's what we're doing. We're measuring the voltage drop across the ground circuit, and then uh, understanding what that resistance means. And if that resistance goes above our high limit threshold, which again is set to either 100 milli ohms or 200 milli ohms, depending on the uh, standard here specifically under the pass criteria box you can see impedance protective earthing circuit on a DUT should be less than 100 or equal to a 100 milli ohms for DUTs with non-detachable supply cords and uh, for non-detachable supply cords impedance for the DUT should be less than 200 milli ohms so that's a very small number um, and that's where offsetting uh, components of your of your test system is important because if, if you do have a, a full med test application and you're incorporating a ground bond test 
you now need to think of, of the adapter box that you're using and any return leads, making sure we offset the resistance in those uh, conductive components to make sure they don't count against you uh, because that 100 milliohm or 200 milliohm number is a very small gap uh, between pass and fail. So that was the ground bond test. Sequentially, the next test you should be performing uh, when abiding to IC 60601-1 should be your hypothesis afterwards. Um, as I just referred to, it's also referred to as a hypothesis. Uh, it's used to determine whether the insulation of a product is able for a period of time without breaking down. And uh, in some of the next slides, I'll define what breakdown means. So uh, hang on to that. It is a deliberate application of high voltage potential between the mains input and any exposed dead metal. So what are we doing there when we're applying voltage between my mains input and any exposed dead metal? That's pretty much between my line and neutral together is one point and my ground circuit. And everything between that is the insulation that's protecting your end user. And so that's why we're applying a large force a strong electric field for electrons to try to break through, but you've designed your products to make sure that doesn't happen, and that's what we're confirming here. The resulting leakage current due to the application of high voltage is measured to determine whether a product's insulation is able to withstand that high voltage without a breaking down. So the test verifies that the insulation of a product is capable of protecting the user from any leakage currents as a result of an electrical fault within the product. So again, we can come back to our diagram. This one's a little bit different than the ground bond, but you still see uh, the same connections. Uh, on the left side, we have our Omnia 2, our electric safety analyzer. On the left side, you just have a, an example of an, a product that has a line and a neutral. So here, this inside circuit would be considered your line and neutral, which you can see have been shorted together. And then here your GND is your ground circuit, uh, which is at one point connected to your chassis or at variable points, actually. And so what do you have there when you when you have a metal insulation and a metal, you're, you're creating capacitive coupling. This is what I was referring to earlier. An AC hypot test may uh, induce too much reactive current, uh, depending how much capacitive coupling you see, right? And so then now you get into um, a sticky spot where you might be failing due to the reactive nature of your product, but there is no blatant short between your mains and your ground. And so there's a few solutions we you can use to try to get through that problem, which is uh, adding a ramp up time or a longer ramp up time if you already have one. And so what does that do? The, the rate of change in voltage, if that decreases, then your reactive current will decrease. Um, if that doesn't help, then that's where you're given the option in the standard to test in DC. And so once your test has reached its test voltage, uh, there's no more reactive current. It's all purely resistive because the voltage is no longer changing. Okay, so again, a dielectric withstand test uh, can be a type test uh, or a routine test. Um, so by routine, we meant, mean on the manufacturing floor, I may have misstated uh, this earlier. So a type test is for a prototype test, um, but a ground bond is a routine test along with the high bot test. Those are usually seen um, cohabitating together in a test system ran one after the other. Um, so again, type test, prototype testing in the lab, uh, we're, we're identifying a new product, making sure our prototype is safe. And then once we've uh, solidified that design, we go to our routine test, which is on the mag manufacturing floor done on every single product that's getting shipped out. So again, it's used to detect possible defects in the design of a product and workmanship defects such as inadequate creepage or clearance distances. So a lot of times in the manufacturing process, there can be uh, 
conductive metal shards or scraps left, which can be burned off by the hypot test. Um, so a lot of times if you fail a hypot test initially on a product for the first time, it's, it's a good habit to run it again and see if uh, any of those impurities are gone now and you get your pass that you're looking for. So this test is performed both on class one and class two products. Now we do have full webinars on the hypot test where we discuss what a class one and a class two product are and how to perform these tests on those specific ones. Um, you can go to our uh, website or our YouTube page where we've we've been doing these webinars for 10 years and, and, and you can almost 10 years and uh, you can find specific information on all these topics we're discussing today. Uh, and so I won't get in too much into what class one and class two is, um, but if you do want more information on that, feel free to visit our website. So the test can be performed in both AC and DC mode based on the safety standard. However, AC test is more stressful than DC hypot test. So why would we consider the AC test uh, more stressful? And that's because um, you're seeing those peak voltages of AC, right? So you're not just seeing a, a, a thousand, if you set up a thousand volt AC hypot test and a thousand volt DC, sure the effective value of that AC hypot test is the same as that thousand DC, but you're getting those peaks, right? Thousand times 1.414, so 14 for for uh, one moment of that frequency, you're you're getting 1400 volts, uh, positive and negative on both sides. So that's why it's a little bit more uh, stressful test than the DC hypot test. Test voltage and trip settings must be specified by the manufacturer in accordance with the safety standard. So I, here I put a, a snippet of uh, IEC 60601, where not only does it display here that al alternatively you can use a DC uh, test equal to the effective value of that uh, AC hypot test, um, but identifying what our failure thresholds are. So during the test, breakdown constitutes a failure. Doesn't really give you a number, right? Insulation breakdown is considered to have occurred when the current which flows as a result of the application of the test voltage rapidly increases in an uncontrolled manner. So what they're saying is, that's the epitome of a, of a breakdown. So our hypot testers have transformers with specifications, right? Those transformers internally can only output a certain amount of current. And we can regulate that current. We can measure it. We, we understand um, how much is drawn. But when a breakdown occurs, when a failure of insulation occurs, a direct short occurs between your mains and your ground. And what happens when a short happens? Well, you can say infinite current is drawn, right? Or the max amount of current that your uh, that transformer can output. And so we can see that. We can see when our transformer quickly outputs past its specifications. And so when we see that, an overcurrent condition, that's one part of us defining, alerting the user, the operator, that a breakdown has occurred via a, a breakdown failure. And so it's up to the manufacturers to decide, do you want to set a hard limit, right? Well, I understand the hypot tester will identify a breakdown, Perhaps internally, I want to know that none of my products leak more than five milliamps or, or a range that you've predefined that you feel comfortable with. Um, so a standard will just say, hey, no breakdown shall occur. That's, again, the minimum that you can do to, to consider your product safe. Uh, but it's important to, to create internal uh, standards that say, I want to make sure all my products fall within this range and we're not just looking for flat out breakdowns. Um, okay, so now when we're talking about IC 60601-1, uh, we're talking about a few different types of hypot tests that occurs. And to understand that, we need to talk about means of protection or MOP, which is divided into two categories. Uh, MOOP or MOOP, means of operator protection, um, 
is applied to situations where the equipment will not come into contact with the patient at all. Um, a couple of examples, in vitro diagnostic devices, um, which are used in medical laboratories, such as centrifuges, are often classified as requiring move home, okay? Where different types of medical devices uh, have means of patient protection, which is any equipment that is used in a medical environment in an area which means patients could come into contact with it. This requires at least one means of patient protection. Uh, again, that's MOP as opposed to MOOP. Uh, this includes everything from hospital beds and lighting to ultrasounds and uh, MRI machines. So specific machines that are built to be placed on the patient. Uh, defibrillators, dia uh, dialysis machines, the highest level of protection specified in the standard requires at least two uh, means of patient protection. So the dielectric strength test requirements differ between these two categories. So this is uh, table six, which voltage requirements are listed in table six. Um, here's a table which uh, can be a little bit difficult to read, but if you can see this left side is means of operator protection and the right side is means of patient protection. And all the way to the left, we see what is the rated voltage that your device will be using. And so for the most part, the highest rated voltage uh, for most medical device products out there is uh, 120 to 240, right? So we can go into this uh, 240 uh, bar here and or row and see that they're telling us for, for one MOOP and two MOOP, it's 1,503,000. Um, and for means of patient protection, we can see as high as 4,000 volts. And that's our, our applied part high pot. So we I kind of made this table here to move aside all the, all the distractions of that huge table and just look at what we really care about. And so it's up to the manufacturer to decide whether the equipment only requires MLP for the operator, or uh, which is means of operator protection, or whether the more stringent patient levels are required, which is MOP, means of patient protection. If the manufacturer decides a MOOP is enough, it will have to back up its reasoning with a risk assessment as per ISO 14971, which examines how likely it is that a patient, patient will come into contact with the equipment. Uh, so again, uh, one means of operator protection, you're looking at about a 1500 volt AC high pot test that's considered basic insulation. Uh, at double insulation for MOOP, we're looking at 3,000 volts. Um, these creepage values are the, are the spaces between um, um, the two live circuits that, that is expected. So the air gap or the insulation. Um, now, if we're looking at means of um, patient protection, uh, basic, it will still be a 1500 volt high pot test, but most applied parts uh, need two means of operator, or I'm sorry, of patient protection, which is 4,000 volt. That's probably, uh, there's, there's a couple special applications, but for the most part, a 4,000 volt high pot test is, uh, is one of the higher uh, voltage high pots that you'll see. And that's specifically for applied parts. Um, and again, we have uh, special ways of performing those um, using our scanners and making sure um, you're testing to mains, applied part to ground, applied part to applied part. So there's a lot of different insulation barriers need to be tested on these devices. So uh, our next test, we've gone through uh, ground bound high pot, applied part high pot, um, is leakage current. And so I wanna make sure, let me get through these slides pretty quickly so that uh, I don't steal too much of Vishan's thunder because he's gonna go deep into not only uh, a leakage current test, but you know what is patient leakage, what is mains and applied part leakage. Um, so the more I talk about what he's gonna talk about, the more time I'm taking away from him, so let me stop. So line uh, current tests are performed on electrical products to measure the leakage current, which could flow through a person while the product is operating. So this is the one 
main difference from this test is that the product is actually powered on and it's powered on at 110% of its rated voltage. And we're using a measuring device to simulate the impedance of the human body under different conditions, depending upon the application of the product. So what's that mean is, is what that means is within the standard, you're given a specific measuring device, what it should look like, a, a simple RC circuit to uh, emulate the resistance the human body has. And when measuring through that, we can now predict how much current a person would see if that fault were to occur on them. So this test is uh, ran under both normal and single fault conditions and reverse polarity on the input line at 110% of rated voltage. And uh, just to take a look at those fault conditions here, our S1 switch, you can see, is our neutral. And so what that's trying to replicate is power going out of a hospital. What happens when your neutral line, what happens when you're in a hospital bed and you have this medical equipment connected to you and all of a sudden the power goes out? All of a sudden that S1 switch opens. Will that cause an increase of leakage current through that MD? That's one of the things we want to see. Um, the S2 switch is us reversing the polarity of the input voltage. Okay, so what happens if you're moved from one hospital room to another? And in that room, the electrician reversed the line in neutral. Okay, the product will still turn on, uh, but now current's flowing the other way. Will that increase the, the amount of uh, fault current seen on the human body? And lastly, I think the, uh, the most uh, obvious way of seen the highest level of leakage current is the S3 switch, which is the ground, the ground circuit. When that ground is opened up, you no longer have that safety net to catch that fault current. And so the MD will be seeing all that current, MD again symbolizing the human body. Um, here's an example of what the MD looks like in uh, in uh, IEC 60601-1. Again, you can see it's a simple uh, RC circuit, and these are already built into our Omnis. We have about 10 different standards or 10 different measuring devices from different standards in our Omnis, um, ready for you to just select. You don't have to build it, but if you are using uh, a one-off standard, um, we do have a, a space for you to build the specific, uh, the specific MD you're looking for. So let me, uh, I think I will pass it off to Pishan now. Uh, I want to thank everyone for, for your attention and I hope you found uh, my part of the information useful, but now let's bring uh, who you really came for into this. So Pishan, if you want to take over and I'll, I'll let you finish off the webinar from here. All right, thanks very much, Tony. And I'm going to take over really quick. All right, so hi everyone, my name is Bishan Patel and welcome to this part of the uh, webinar. In this webinar, or this part of the webinar, I'm gonna be going over in detail to where to look for the particular items that were mentioned earlier by Tony. Um, first, let's start off with the 60601 standard. This is a base standard, generally known as the um, particular uh, standard that is comp compromised with two additional uh, standards. You could have collateral standards and particular standards. For particular standards, uh, these are specifically mentioned for equipment that are like surgical equipment, endoscopic equipment, um, and these apply to particular type of uh, devices that are being manufactured. Uh, for collateral standards, you are looking at uh, testing to be performed for uh, EMC, for uh, home health use. So depending on which type of product you are manufacturing, um, there's uh, quite a few standards that apply within 60601. So 60601-1 is the base standards and anything else additional that applies to your product could be found in either the collateral standards or the particular standards. Now, this, what the standard does is that is uh, for safety testing requirement, it classifies your product into uh, the type of class one, class two, or an other uh, medical electrical equipment. For class one product, generally these are grounded uh, to the wall outlet or an earth ground. 
for class two products, these are um, double insulated products. They have no grounding circuit, but provide isolation from ground or live mains voltages by two layers of uh, protect, uh, protection. You have products that also have applied parts. Tony mentioned earlier, there, uh, there are means of operator protection and there's means of patient protection. For patient protection, that anything that comes in contact with the patient, uh, you're gonna have some applied part to your product. If you have applied part, they can be categorized into uh, three different classifications, type B applied part, uh, type BF, and then type CF. The type B applied part are generally provides protection by grounding. So basic isolation is provided by grounding the medical device. The type BF is considered to be a floating type of pro, uh, product, which provides isolation from mains, uh, basic uh, isolation from mains. Now, when we're talking about BF type, there's another type uh, called the CF type product. Uh, the CF type products do come in direct contact with the cardiovascular system of our body. Uh, these are more stringent requirements come into play for the CF type products. Uh, imagine a surgical equipment that goes into a human body to uh, perform surgeries. This comes in direct contact with the patient. So this product would have a lot more stringent requirement for any stray leakage current that may happen. I'm gonna be talking about the requirements uh, from the standards uh, in the next few slides. But just to review what Tony already mentioned, there's type testing and routine testing. So when you're making your product, when you're doing your R&D uh, for your product, uh, it is important to get these tests or the tests uh, specified in the standards correct from the get-go. Um, changes made to the product at a later point to meet these standards may be costly. Uh, we talked about the impedance, current, uh, impedance and current carrying capability, generally known as a ground bond test the dialectic stand test, uh, and the leakage current test. So now within the standards, where can you find these information? So let's take a look at the ground bond test. Um, the, just gonna go quickly go over this. Uh, there's a clause in the standards and the section eight uh, starts with, um, the shot, uh, section eight starts with the protection against electrical shock. Part of the section, there's a clause 8.6.4 that talks about the requirements for having a ground bond test performed. This was mentioned earlier, a 25 amp current will be passed through the grounding circuit to make sure the ground, ground circuit is able to carry 25 amps of current. The pass criteria might be either 100 milliohms of resistance on this ground circuit, or it could be up to 200 milliohms depending on the, uh, the detached or attached cord. Now, Tony talked about the dielectric resistance test. You could find this information in section or clause 8.8.3, dielectric strength. Um, requirements. For this, uh, table six was referred. There's also a table seven that refers to additional requirements for any HIPAA test voltages for products that are uh, exceeding uh, 200 volts or 240 volts. Uh, we mentioned that the, the, the test voltage depends on two factors, the peak working voltage. So if you have mains input coming in for your product, uh, the label on your product says 240 volts. The working voltage would be the uh, DC equivalent. So the peak voltage of an AC sign of 240 volts. So the classification of voltage, um, you look up in the table to find where does a 240 volts uh, AC fall in for peak voltages. And the second item that was mentioned that uh, means of protection. So if you have an operator protection, the voltages are different. Uh, for patient protection, the voltage are much higher. We want to isolate the mains input from uh, the patient connector and the requirements are generally much higher. Let's take a look at an example for a, a product that has a 240 volt mains input. Looking at the table six, this will require to run an AC high path test of 1500 volts. If this, this product also has any patient connectors, this will require to run a high path test at the patient connector of up to 4000 volts. This is also known as a VM force high path test or um, a patient, a, a patient part, applied part high path test. Then if you want to look at all the sections that talk about uh, leakage current testing or in um, the clause 8.7 is where the standard refers to leakage current and patient auxiliary current. Uh, this is where different types of testing requirement comes into play for testing the leakage current of a product. Um, Tony already mentioned what we're looking for in this case. If there is single fault condition, you know, open ground, open neutral, reverse polarity, we could also measure normal leakage current. What happens if this product is normally powered on? Can the patient feel any leakage coming out of the applied part? Um, one of the main requirements is applying voltage at 110%. And 
the placement of the measuring device is what is the main difference between different types of leakage current tests that can be performed. So let's go over some of the additional requirements that come out of the section or the clause 8.7. 8.7.4 um, states that earth leakage is mentioned in figure 13. Touch current is mentioned in figure 14. Patient journal, which is section 8.7.47, this talks about leakage current between patients. Uh, how can you have, how, how would an, a patient uh, connected to different ports of your medical device feel current between those two points? Um, patient auxiliary is mentioned under uh, figure 19. Again, this is the current that will flow between two applied parts connected to a patient. I also want to point out that during a patient leakage, you, you're looking at uh, current that will flow from patient connection to earth. You're also looking for um, mains and applied parts. So what a lot of the CF type product needs is that uh, a scenario where a CF type product could become energized by line voltage. If the CF type product became energized by line voltage, your medical device does not cannot provide a path for this current to travel to earth. And I'm going to be showing this um, in, in, a, in, a, in a graphical way to show how this happens uh, inside a, a, a measuring device. As I mentioned earlier, type uh, type of products that you have um, depends on uh, either you have a applied part that's uh, type B or BF or CF. The different types of leakage currents are mentioned in table four. Table four mentions the earth leakage current in a normal condition and also single pole condition for all three different types of applied part. Uh, there's additional requirements for um, enclosure leakage, also known as a touch current. So if you had an, a medical device that has an enclosure point or an enclosed chassis point, which may or may not be grounded uh, internally, if there's a metal enclosure point, uh, somebody could come in contact with it, this is known uh, as an enclosure leakage current test. And the requirements are listed in table four for the maximum amount of current that's allowable uh, for this type of test. And further down, you will see the patient leakage current, again, mains, on, mains voltage applied to an applied part. What kind of leakage are you able to see uh, when the mains voltage is applied to an applied part? So again, it applies to type BF type products and CF type products. And during a single fault condition, the maximum allowed leakage is 5 million for BF type products. And then you have um, 0 0.05 milliamps of leakage current. So 50 microamps is all that's allowed for type CF during a mains and applied part testing. So what does this mean? So we have an, a measuring device, an MD. An MD is nothing more than a human body impedance network of representing what a human body looks like to an electrical signal. When we take a look at that, uh, imagine a patient um, being connected to a grounded part of your device. How much leakage current is this patient going to feel if they come in, in contact with a grounded part of your product? If your product is well grounded, the outlet is well grounded, all the excessive current that's floating on the chassis of the product will travel straight down to earth ground using the grounded um, wall outlet. If in case the ground opens up, within the device or if the ground, ground opens up because the outlet is ungrounded, the patient, which is the measuring device, is gonna feel all the leakage current flow through it through ground. So this is the actual current we're measuring. So let me get my highlighter hot here really quick and kind of show. You're gonna have leakage current that builds up on the top of the a medical device. If this was well grounded, it would travel straight to earth ground. If it's ungrounded, the flow that would happen would happen through the measuring device to ground. So if a uh, grounded person or person that's standing on ground or sitting on or uh, uh, sleeping on a hospital bed that's grounded, earth leakage will flow through the medical uh, medical device through the grounded surface through the MD. And this is the current we're measuring for earth leakage. When it comes to enclosure leakage, I mentioned earlier the enclosure point could be a metal uh, accessible part that may or may not be grounded. In this point, uh, a, a patient comes in contact with an enclosure point, um, and then at that enclosure point, how much leakage current can this patient feel while this product is powered up to a full operating condition? Now, when I go to consulting, we feel 
Uh, I feel that majority of times people are just looking for a quick test, but the standards actually require that this product be tested at full operating condition or full uh, operating uh, mode. So if a surgical drill that needs to come on, the power needs to be applied to the surgical drill to be powered on. Uh, if any, uh, any of the accessory needs to be turned on, the product needs to be fully powered on in normal operating condition to be able to see how much leakage current will flow to an enclosure. Another type of enclosure leakage is the uh, leakage between two applied parts. Imagine having two applied parts on your product. Uh, how much can a compression connected to these applied parts? Is there any current flowing between these two points? So again, to demystify the, the standards and how they show the images, uh, figures, um, you know, electrical figures, you could see that uh, uh, enclosure between uh, enclosure leakage could be simplified between uh, two applied parts in, in this manner. Next, I want to take a look at for a second. Now, if you were to take a look at the figures in the standards, this is how they're representing the figure. So imagine you have a, a mains input for your product. A T1 transformer isolates the voltage to power up your product. So on the right here, uh, label one is going to be your device under test. It will take voltage in to power up the product. And then on this side here, you have uh, label number four. These are applied parts. If you have any applied parts to your product, again, type B, type BF, or CF, um, depending on where you put the MD determines what type of leakage current you're measuring. What's going to happen here is that any leakage current that happens through the mains input with each are the mains input here. And if it flows through your applied part back to a reference point, which is the low side of the transformer, the MD should be able to measure how much leakage current the, the patient's going to be subjected to. Sorry about that. So we talked about earth leakage, we talked about enclosure leakage, and now and patient auxiliary leakage. So now let's talk about additional testing requirements uh, that are meant for um, in the standard 60601. Figure 16 is mains voltage and applied part. Within this uh, uh, section of the testing, there's also external voltage on the uh, signal input or output, and external voltage on metal accessible part that are not protected with earth. So figures 16 and 17 and 18 are some of the most advanced testing that the standard is requiring to do. And this generally applies to products that are um, either BF type product or CF type applied part product. So what does it entail? A, a mains on applied test, also known as a MOAB, um, what you're looking at is you're applying voltage to an applied part through an external source. What we have in the standards is gonna show you a transformer T2. This is again applying line voltage coming through a, an isolation transformer. The voltage is applied through a, a current limiting resistor to ensure operator safety during testing uh, through the MD. So the MD, imagine having one arm of the um, patient coming in contact with line voltage through a transformer. The second part of the MD, which is uh, maybe the right side of the MD or a patient is connected to an applied part. If I'm sitting in a hospital bed, if something falls on me and makes me fully energized at 260 volts, 240 volts, can this DUT or device under test, which is uh, your medical device la labeled one, can it allow a flow to happen through the applied part? Is there something that happens when you apply voltage to the applied part that allows a flow happen this way? And this is what you're measuring. So if, if this flow is there, um, this is this could be this could be a worst case scenario that, that would happen to an applied part being coming becoming an energized at 240 volts. Again, the placement of MD is important. Uh, left side of the MD is connected to a voltage source. Uh, right side of the MD is connected to uh, applied part of your product. You're still going to power up the device under test at a full 110% voltage, so your product is fully powered on. The fault conditions are simulated using switches S5, 10, and S7. Again, uh, another switch here is S9 is reverse polarity. So what happens if one side of the wall outlet is at the, um, one polarity, the other side of the wall outlet is the opposite polarity. Now, if you have two different polarities, 
there's a possibility that leakage current may be higher if the patient ever comes in contact with the live source while connected to the different frequency from a different side of the wall. Next, I'm going to go into looking at the, the main zone sip up. Imagine having a connection to your medical device that has a LAN connection or a connection that's a signal input or output port. What happens if you know, somebody in IT applies voltage to the LAN, LAN card or the LAN input of your product? If they apply voltage to the, the signal input port, can your device, which is your medical device, allow any flow of current through happen uh, through the measuring device. This is what they're measuring. They're measuring how much leakage would happen if you apply voltage onto a SIP sub connection. Now, these are special subset of the um, uh, mains voltage uh, testing. So you could have mains on SIP sub, mains on uh, a metal part, which is not particularly earth, and mains on applied part. So we looked at the images that are called out in the standards, figure 13, 14, all the way to uh, 17 and 18. Now, what I would like to do right now is to go over how these tests can be performed using um, uh, some of these equipment that are available in, in the market. Now, I'm going to review the MAT test application note here. Let me just make sure I get the right. And what I'd like to do here is to go over the MET test application node. So in this, we're going to go over what kind of equipment is required to run the, the, the test that I mentioned earlier. And once you have these equipment, how easy it is to kind of set up the test that you need. Now, for this one, we're going to be using our Omnia 2 model 8200 uh, electrical safety compliance. Earlier that you could have some scanning matrices that would allow you to apply voltages into different parts of the uh, product. We also had a visit, a consulting visit that we did for customers where uh, they had multiple ground bond tests that were required. So if they had three different ground points and their re requirements were to test all three different ground bond tests, um, the customer was able to perform these in a fully automated fashion by using scanning matrices or multiplexer. So the ground bond test will go from chan one channel to a second channel to a third channel uh, and test all three ground uh, points at the same time. So this is where the scanning matrix will come in. So you could have high voltages, again, applied parts with different functionality would have to be tested separately. So applied part A uh, needs 4,000 volts to ground. Applied part B needs to be tested 4,000 volts to ground. Uh, if they're the same functionality, you could tie them together. If they're different functionality, they need to be tested individually. So the leakage current test multiplies uh, depending on what kind of functionality your applied part has. And then we're going to also have a secondary source. This applies the T2 transformer that was mentioned earlier in the figure. So you need a T1, which will power up the medical device itself. T2 will apply voltage to an applied part as required by the standard. And this is what a setup would look like. So I just want to go over this really quick. Um, with our, a medical device with two applied parts, um, you make a connection to a back of a, a testing equipment. Um, this will power up your device and the test. And any leakage current measure uh, will be measured between these two points, which are probe, probe high connection and probe low connection on back of the equipment. Similarly here, if you have um, ground bond test performed, uh, a, a medical device, your ground bond test is going to be performed between a ground pin of the product and a chassis. So just really quick, I want to show how our instrument is going to measure this current. It's going to output current between the ground pin, will travel through the device ground circuit, and exit from the chassis of the device, and go back to our equipment. We're measuring 25 amps flow between these two points to see if the uh, resistance is less than 100 milliohms or 200 milliohms. Now, when it comes to a high pod test. Similarly, we were applying high pod tests. Uh, there's quite a different types of high pod tests you have to perform. You have to perform a high pod test between the mains here 
to ground or chassis, mains here to an applied part, and then you have a test between applied part to applied part. So these, these are three different types of high pot tests that are required. There's also four tests that requires you to have um, um, applied part to ground. So there's uh, a few different tests of high, different types of applied part, high pot and normal high pot tests that you have to run. Uh, some of them may be uh, 1500 volts, the normal insulation, and others may be up to 4,000 volts of um, test voltage that are required. Again, this shows you the hot, the high pot test on applied part and how the connections are being made. Having the scanning matrix helps in, the, in essence that you, when you have two applied part, you may be able to do one applied part at a time, or you could tie both of them at the same uh, time, and you're performing a cumulative high pot test uh, with those two points connected. And then when you have earth leakage, you're gonna have leakage current that's flows to, um, uh, uh, through the chassis of this product. So any leakage ha that happens between line neutral to ground, while this product is fully powered on, is going to be measured by an MD that lies within this um, Omnia 2 tester. When it comes to enclosure leakage or other types of leakage, similar items are followed. Um, the connection stays the same. Now, only thing we're changing is how and where the MD sits. So for an enclosure leakage, you need access to the touch point, um, which is gonna be a, of an enclosure point for your product. And the measuring device still measures current that flows between an enclosure point to a reference earth, which is all within this 8207 or 8257 uh, Omnia 2 tester. And lastly, some of the applied part testing. So when it comes to applied part testing, you have to be able to apply a secondary voltage to uh, the applied part. So how do we do this? We use a transformer two to apply voltage to a scanning matrix or scanning point, a scanner point. Uh, this Intel will apply voltage to your um, one of the applied parts. So um, applied part one, uh, applied part two will be um, in, in connection with the probe low side of the circuit and um, transformer two will follow to the probe high side of the circuit. So again, having this system in place allows you to go from what's required in the standard to simplify your testing. Um, what I've seen in consulting is that when, when, when we're looking at one customer that has 10 different units, but their test types are varying throughout all different types of uh, devices. So one, one device might only have the earth leakage, the other device may not even run the earth leakage and only does an applied part test uh, leakage. Um, when, we're on, when we're in the field, we recognize that if the understanding was there that the equipment that you have is able to run all these types of tests, it's recommended that you kind of standardize these tests across all your products, you know. Um, you do not want to have only a few tests ran while you're leaving away, um, you know, an applied part that may be, may be left. And we're coming up on our time for today. And um, lastly, uh, what I want to review today is my uh, how easy the software could be used to control and uh, program this. So let me pull that up really quick. All right, so this is our uh, AutoWare 3 software. It's a full con fully controlled automated software to control our Omnia testers. Uh, uh, quite a few systems uh, can be connected to this. Again, I mentioned a, a transformer two, which is a supply to apply uh, voltage to applied part. You could also have scanning matrices and uh, a, a main tester itself, the Omnia. What I want to mention here is uh, you go from what the standard shows you and you come here and then you apply those voltages to the proper location. for. A, for a ground bond test, the parameters are um, your impedance and current carrying capabilities, 25 amps, high limit of 100 milliohms. These all could be set within the software. Um, next, you want to take a look at high pot voltage. I want to apply high pot voltage between line neutral to ground at 1500 volts. So you could apply 1500 volts between line neutral and ground. Next, I want to apply voltage between uh, an applied part to ground. How do I do that? So we're using the scanning matrices 
if my applied parts were connected to channel one, two, three, and four, imagine four applied parts, I could apply 4,000 volts to any of these signals that are red, and the stressing would happen between the applied part and ground. And then lastly, you could continue on and um, do the leakage current test. So just to show you a simple uh, leakage current uh, parameter within our software, you have a, a leakage current value that can be set high, low, you also have the probe condition. So you want to have either uh, earth leakage, you want to have touch current or enclosure leakage, or you want to do the SIPSOP or MOAP. Those are all considered point-to-point -point connection. So the probe configuration is important where the probe sits. Next thing is most important is also the merging device. Different type of merging device apply to different standards. We're going to stick to 60601 here, but you can see that there's additional merging devices available within our equipment. And lastly, you want to worry about the, the conditions here. So you have an open or closed neutral, open or closed ground, and either the polarity is reversed or normal. Now there's three switches, two different conditions, uh, creates eight different steps, uh, uh, eight different combinations of either single fault and normal condition. Now some people do like to skip over some of these tests because the standard says single fault condition. Um, some of these are dual fault condition, but we recommend since you're selling medical equipment, is to cover all the bases. Cover, uh, if, it's, if it requires you two additional minutes to run a test for the complete system, uh, it's highly recommended. And then lastly, I wanna show how scanners are used to perform these tests for multi, um, main zone applied part testing, MOAP. If you have main zone applied part testing, again, your probe condition will be probe high to probe low. I wanna measure between these two points. What are those two points? Well, high point would be channel one and channel three low point could be channel nine and channel 11. So I'm using the scanning matrices to perform a set of tests that require in the standard and uh, fully automate the system. And it's not unheard of to see a person hook up all the wires, run the test, and the test runs for 20, 30 minutes. I've been to customers where um, what they do is set up all the tabling properly, but you're not depending on the operator to make all the right connections. You're only depending on a validated system to make all the connections. Uh, what I do want to show you is just quickly how, this is just a simulation obviously, but this is similarly how the instrument would run to our software. I do want to show you the record keeping side of this thing, so I'm going to uh, label this model one and a given serial number, and quickly just have it run through a test. It shouldn't take more than a few seconds. Obviously the times have to be adjusted for your device to power on, uh, the voltage to stay on between those steps, but here you're applying for 1500 volts, the next test automatically applies voltages to the right place of 4,000. So different voltages are being applied at different points. Um, now we get to uh, earth leakage part of this. There's a prompt. If you had any additional connection that needed to be made, um, this those could be made. Uh, for mains and applied or mains of up. Now, these tests may have to be repeated for different types of applied parts. So this is one particular applied part. Set of eight tests may be repeated for other tests. And this is how you get to about a test that's 50, 60 you know, steps in place and also maybe 20 minutes that it takes to fully run the, the suite of tests. Um, I did want to show you the Okay, so this is a printer report. Obviously it shows you uh, the model number, the serial number, the time and date it was tested on and the results within one file. Uh, this could be also printed and any comments could be added on here. We, the, the, in the demo minute, it doesn't show you, but instrument serial number, instrument firmware version, the calibration due date are all printed on the, on the report itself. Okay, so that was a quick demo. I know we're a little bit over on our time. Uh, I do wanna go back to our PowerPoint slide really quick and just mention a few things really quick. We do have consulting packages that, um, that we actually come out to the facility to do your operator education on how to perform these tests properly, how to do a safe workstation, and also do a, uh, help you with your system validation. One of the most critical aspects of what we have seen is that most of these systems are designed by somebody five, 10, 15 years ago and the person right now are just performing those tests according to those uh, documentation. When something goes wrong or new product comes in, 
uh, their understanding is not there to kind of create the actual documentation that's needed. Uh, like I mentioned earlier, I've been to facilities where one product will run earth leakage, other product will run earth leakage and applied part uh, leakage, and a third product will run applied part um, and um, mains and applied part leakage current test. So within the same facility, there's three different tests and uh, no one ever questioned why we're only running one test versus the other system that runs three different tests. So uh, that's our applicants consulting part of the things. Um, if you do have any questions, you can contact uh, Brit Brittany Soha. Her email is listed here. She will also post an email uh, within the chat. And I do want to open up the, uh, uh, for any questions that you may have right now about the webinar. And Brittany, let me know if there are any questions, or Syed, let me know if there are any questions I could answer. I think we're good, Bishan. Questions? Yeah, no questions on uh, the chat box, Bishan. Thank you. Okay. All right. And um, well, I want to thank everyone for attending the webinar today. And uh, if you do have any questions, obviously, you have ways to reach out to us. And uh, hope to hear from you soon.